Hi, you found Why We Are Christians. I'm Stephanie Erickson. Today I'm speaking with Mary Kay Mancebo. Mary Kay, thanks so much for joining us today. Thank you. Thanks for inviting me. Absolutely. We're going to find out a little bit about your early life, then we'll find out about how you became a Christian, and then we'll find out about why you've remained a Christian. So let's start right up. Tell us a little bit about your early life. I know you were born in Columbus, Ohio. What was your family like? Um, well, uh, yes, I was born in Columbus, but we lived in a very rural, poor area. Um, and I got indoor plumbing when I was eight years old. Ooh. So um, that was a, a, a nice thing. I have uh, two sisters and a brother. Um, Where do you fall in the line? I am the second of four. Okay. And um, my, my dad and my mom, uh, my mom stayed home. My dad was a painter and handyman and did things like that. Um, and we just uh, had, a, had a great family life. My, uh, my mother's extended family, aunts and uncles, there were lots of them, and we got together with them a lot. Uh, not so much with my family on my dad's side, but on my mother's side, we always spent time with them, holidays, reunions. Um, several years ago, about three years ago, I went back to the 75th. Wow. Family reunion. Oh, that must have been fun. So that was interesting. <laughs> <laughs> so, so are your parents still married? No. When I was eight years old, my mother and father um, divorced. Oh. Um, little story in there, but um, they they divorced, and then um, my mother then had to go to work, and so that left us uh, staying with aunts and uncles and cousins until my sister got a little older and then they decided that she could watch us. Mm -hmm. So we, we just hung out at home while my mom worked. I know we, um, I do remember that one Christmas, if it hadn't been for the Salvation Army um, coming to our house and dropping off a food basket and gifts, we wouldn't have had anything for Christmas. Mm. So I always remember that mm -hmm. and I um, and thankful for that, yes. you know. So we we did, um, you know, improve as things went. But my mom had to work, and that was pretty hard on us. So time times got pretty tough. Now, um, but they got a divorce when you were eight. I was eight. So she had just gone back to work. Yes, and she had to go back to their work. Their marriage fell apart. No, she. They got a divorce, and then she oh, went back I to work. See. Okay. Yes. Um, and when they got a divorce, did you then live with your mom? I lived with my mom, and when I was 12 years old, um, my mom told me she hated me to my face. Now, kids tell their parents, I hate you, right? but parents do not tell their children, I hate you. Right. And it really affected me. It affected me that my dad wasn't with me, you know? And so I called my dad and I told him that I wanted to come and live with him. So we went to court, and I went to live with my dad. Oh, wow. Okay, and so it was a formalized yes, decision by yes, the courts. Yes. What, um, when your mom told you this, were, were you the only child she said this to, or was she feeling the same way towards her other kids? No, I'm the, I'm the only one that hmm. she said it to. So you're the only one that then went to live with your dad? Correct. And how did that go? Um, it was okay. Mm -hmm. I, I didn't mind it. I did miss my family. I missed sure. my, my sisters and my brother and I my guess. cousins and stuff because I didn't go to get to go to the things that we went to, you know. Right. Um, Where did your did your dad live close to your mom? Um, probably about a half an hour away. He lived mm. in Columbus. Mm. So you would have needed transportation in order Correct. to... Correct. Yes. Okay. Um, and then um, when I was 14, my mother remarried and um, I wanted to go to the wedding okay. Mm -hmm. okay and so I called my aunt and asked her to come get me so I could stay with her for the weekend and go to the wedding and then when the wedding I didn't bring a dress and my aunt said you didn't bring a dress you got to have a dress for the wedding so she took me back to my dad's house my house and when I went in something was different and um, when I went in the bedroom to get the dress, my dad came in there with me and he told me that I was ruining his life and that he didn't want me to come back. Oh my gosh, Mary Kay, that must have been heartbreaking for you. It was very, 
very, um, it was. <laughs> was there was there something going on with your parents? Were they alcoholics nope. or nope. Uh, were there drugs or anything? They nope. were just, nope. seems like two kind of self-centered people. My dad was very selfish and my mom wanted to be, you know, go out and do things. Go to the Grange and go so square you were, dancing. You were in their way. You were just, well, not because of who you were, but just because you were a kid and they didn't want to have that responsibility right now. Um, not, no, I, I don't think it was that. My, okay. I, with my dad, yes, because he had um, a woman friend and um, she had to move out of the house so I could move in and oh. that kind of... Cramped his style. Yes, yeah. and so um, he, so I went back to live with my mom. Okay. It's like, where do you go, you know? Right. Right. So my mom's getting married, so I go and I go to the wedding, and then I go back and get my stuff from my dad's and go back and move with my mom. And um, I didn't really um, care for my stepfather. I hated him. Mm. He was taking me away from my dad and moving us to California. Now, why was he moving to California? Because he was in the Marine Corps. And so we moved to Camp Pendleton area and got a house there. But still, my mother and I didn't have a very good relationship. Um, the other kids were her more her favorites than, than me. I was sort of the black sheep. Mm. So when things were done, I didn't really, you know, they would have a birthday cake. If I got one, I was really lucky, you know. Mm. So, um, you know, it, at Christmas time, we'd all get like five Christmas presents. But my mother would say to me, oh, by the way, part of that is your birthday present. Well, my birthday was a month later. Why am I getting a present then? So um, if I wanted something or needed it, I had to earn it myself. So I babysat. I, and that's if I wanted clothes, I made my own clothes and different things like that. So we still didn't um, get along real well. But with my stepfather, I... Uh, didn't want to do anything to um, have him get angry with me or get, you know, so I would be punished. So I was a, I was a very good student. I got on honor roll. I did, uh, um, I was a majorette in the band. And Let me just interrupt you. So you said you were 14 when you moved to California? Yes. Southern California, and that's Southern California. Southern California. California. Mm -hmm. Right. Okay. So, um, and did all, the rest of your siblings move with your mom? Yes, we okay, all did. Okay, so you were all together. So, okay. yeah. With your stepdad. Yes. All right, so you were very, um, uh, you, you took care of yourself, basically. Pretty much. And you made a way for yourself, mm -hmm. and you were doing really well in school. So keep, keep on going. I just wanted to make sure we had the time frame right there. Right. So, um, you know, I would, uh, seem seemed to me that if, um, if I was five minutes late after curfew, I would get two weeks restriction. Ugh. But if my sisters would sneak out through the bedroom window, they wouldn't get as hard a punishment as I would. And they didn't get good grades, I got good grades. My sister, um, well, I won't, my, my sister, um, my older sister uh, was kept behind in third grade. And so we were in the same grade from third grade on through high school. Mm -hmm. So that was a little hard, you know, on that. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. there's, um, you know, we didn't get along very well. <laughs> right, you know. right, right. Some sib sib sibling rivalry there. Right, yeah. right. Yeah. So uh, I'd like the viewers to keep in mind this story as we progress in your story because it seems like some of what you did later on in life was to gain the attention and the acceptance that you didn't have from your parents. Right. Right. I, I, that, is, that is very true. I, I didn't get it from them. And so I was seeking it um, in other places, that song, mm -hmm. Seeking Love in All the Wrong Places. That, <laughs> that's kind of like my theme of my life. <laughs> that, that applied to at, you, at right. That part of my life, yeah. Uh, so, right, right. And, and I was. I was seeking everything. Now, granted, we went to church all the time. Oh, did you? Yes. Okay. When my mom and dad were married, we went to church. When my mom and dad 
were split up, we still went to church. The bus came and picked us up at the end of our driveway. And so we went to church all the time. And, and I loved going to vacation Bible school and doing, doing stuff like that. So, and when I was living with my dad, we went to church every Sunday. And then when I, uh, we moved to California, I still kind of went to church. We lived by the beach. And so a good way to get to go to the beach was, Mom, I'm going to go to church, and then I'm going to go to the beach. So I would dress in a little shift, in a bathing suit under my shift, and I'd trot off to church, and then when I was church was done, I'd go to the beach. Well, that was commendable. You actually did go to church and uh -huh. not just skip church uh -huh. altogether. So, right. So you had a, a, a church in your background. Right, okay. and, and I knew about God, Okay. you know, and I prayed, and mm -hmm. it seemed like my prayers were never getting answered, though, mm -hmm. you know, mm -hmm. but so I was still seeking um, something, right. someone, something right. to do that. Right. So um, I graduated from high school. Um, I don't know if this is um, something, well, I graduated from high school a virgin, which is very rare nowadays. Yeah, very so rare. that I was very, you know, glad of that. But then I, I uh, went off to college, which was right by my house. I could walk to the school. And so um, at the beach, I met a, uh, a guy, and he showed me attention, and I liked the attention that he showed me. So it sounds like the beach was one of the favorite things of yours in Southern California. So you got there every chance you could. Every chance. And so not only did the beach hold its own allure, but there were boys there, and you met one. I met one there. Okay. Yeah, that one really took my life in a, a <sighs> different direction. Um, that was when, um, well, he introduced me to marijuana. He was a, um, a big dealer and smuggled it across and sold a lot of it in the area. Smuggled it across the Mexico, Mexico border. Mexico border, yeah. Because where you lived is close, sort of in the San Diego vicinity. It took me 30 minutes yeah. from my house to get to Tijuana. So. Okay, right, right, right. Okay, keep going. So he introduced you to marijuana. Yes, but he was fascinating. His life was exciting. I liked what it was. He did things that I never did. You know, it was like adrenaline, mm -hmm. you know, when, mm -hmm. and, and then he acted like he liked me. Mm -hmm. And uh, one time he asked to borrow some money because he's going to do this deal. And he said, if I can borrow this money from you, I'll pay you back this amount of money, which was more than I loaned him. And so I did, and, and I got my money back, and so I was still with him, and, you know, we, wherever we went uh, were parties and stuff. He was there. And now, how old were you then at this point? 19. Oh. Eight, 18, 18. Okay, so you met him around 18, 19. Mm -hmm. You were still living with, at your mom's house. Yes. yes. And did your mom know the boy? Did you introduce them? Um, Later on, okay. I don't but think not in the beginning. In the beginning. Right, okay. not in the beginning. Okay. And did your mom catch on that you were starting to dabble with drugs? No. Or, or no. your mom or your stepdad? Okay. No. Nobody really knew. Okay. So, but so, go ahead. <laughs> yeah, keep going. But then, you know, I, I was at home and I lived at home and I always asked my parents if I could do anything, and I'm over 18. I can do what I want, but because I respected them, I always said, can I go to the beach today? So during Easter break, I um, stayed home one day, cleaned and watched my baby sister. My mom and stepfather had a baby when I was almost 16. Mm. And so I uh, stayed home and watched her and cleaned the house and the rest of the kids went off to the beach and stuff. So the next day, my best friend was going to the beach and so uh, that night I said, can I go to the beach with my friend and she said no and I I said why and she wouldn't answer me so the next morning I got up and I asked her again and she wouldn't talk to me so I went in my bedroom and got my beach bag and put extra set of underwear my toothbrush and brush and I had on my bathing suit and my shift and my shoes put it, my beach towel in there and when my friend came in her 55 Chevy <laughs> I walked out the front door and got in her car and never went back Wow so in a way, it's like you ran away unintentionally, but there was some intention, intention in it. Yeah, I thought I might, I, at the, in the beginning, yeah, I, I thought maybe I'd go 
I didn't realize I was not going to come back. Maybe you'd spend the night with your friend or something. Well, or we did. Whatever, we went but, down yeah. to Newport Balboa Island and oh, yeah. watched the cars go by and right. met met some guys and just stayed there. And wow. we just stayed there. We didn't do anything. We just stayed as a place to sleep. Wow. But um, I was there for a while, and then I met a girl, and we got an apartment together, and I got a job, and I still had the boyfriend, you know, still into that part of it. And um, um, things were going okay, you know, but my mother still, we still had nothing, you know. Did you, you communicated her with um, her during this time? Not, no. Not much? No. no. Maybe just to get something. Right. And I really didn't communicate with my dad. I ended up moving from Newport Beach back to Oceanside to an apartment um, with him and lived there. With your boyfriend? Yes. And um, I always thought, because I was in love, that I was doing this the, in the sight of God and that it was good. You know, I, I always thought I was doing it in in the sight of God mm -hmm. and that you know since I'm doing it that way it's good it's okay mm -hmm. you know it's not wrong mm -hmm. and um, so we we started doing a lot of um, um, smuggling back and forth mostly pot mostly pot in the beginning and as it got further along in it he was taking other pills and there were pills you know we, we called them black jackets and uh, reds and blues and yellows and stuff. And, and, yeah. Uh -huh. I didn't like those. I didn't like them uh -huh. because they didn't, I didn't like how they made me feel. Uh -huh. You know, I didn't uh -huh. want to be up all night. And I didn't want to go to sleep before the fun was over. Uh -huh. You know, uh -huh. I wanted to have fun. Uh -huh. And so, um, but then I, I got, had um, a little bit of cramps. And so I got pills for my cramps and I liked how they made me feel. And so instead of taking one, I would take two. Instead of waiting four hours, I would wait an hour and oh. take. So I basically got hooked on Percodan. Oh, <laughs> yeah. And oh. then we, um, one time, um, then he was into heroin already by this time, but I wasn't using it but yet. And so one time he said, let's try this. And um, the first time I tried heroin, I loved it. I was hooked the first day I took it. Really? I liked how it made me feel. I liked um, uh, that it didn't, uh, you know, make me go to sleep and it didn't wire me, I, but it just, I just liked the feeling. Mm. And so I was hooked the first time I mm -hmm. used it. And mm -hmm. so in the beginning, we, I just snorted it, but when it, there was a time then that um, I graduated over to um, shooting up. Mm. And during this time that we were all doing this, we were carrying, I, I brought pounds of heroin across the border. How many times did you go down to, the, to Mexico, like a month? Once a month. Once a month you were, okay. Yeah, or once every other month. It depended okay. on what supplies we needed and if we needed um, more uh, of something, marijuana or something like that. So and you would get large batches and bring them back and then would, would you sell them? Yes, he would. would. Yeah, I wasn't he involved would. in any of the sales, <clears throat> but uh, we didn't always put it in a car. He would hike it over the mountain and I'd pick him up oh, wow. on the American side in my car and then we'd drive home. Now there was something that my boyfriend wanted me to do and he wanted me to always look nice. How often not. were you using heroin at this point? Uh, three or four times a day. Oh, so daily. Daily. Multiple times daily. Yes. Okay. okay. Yes. All right. And and we were using the stuff that we brought over over the border before we cut it. We would take a little piece out here, and this would be ours, and then we, he'd go in the kitchen, and he'd cut it and put it in little bundles that we sold to people up and down the coast. I have to say that... Um, I think that marijuana was the gateway to that, and then that it, um, some people say uh, it doesn't, but it can, and, and it did, and it does, so. Well, I, and you, you, like a lot of people, had an addictive personality or something going on, and um, I can understand that. So 
these drugs helped you, you're probably feeling a lot of pain in your life. You know, a lot of pain from when you were a kid that was lingering and drugs help to mask that pain. Drugs, alcohol, a lot of different things can help mask pain. Yes, and, and I, I did a little alcohol, but I like the drugs better. Telling us that you got a big bunch of heroin in your car. You were looking good. He wanted you to look good, always look good, and you guys had driven down there and you got your car loaded up. Well, I would go in my own car. Okay. And then I would drive back across. Mm -hmm. And because I looked clean cut and right. stuff like that, I, they never thought anything about it, and so I would come across. But then, then there was the time that we went down, and we were going to pick up a big load of uh, marijuana and bring it across, and this time we were going to bring it in my car. And when we got there, I saw all these cars. They looked funny, you know, like mm. undercover cars. I was mm. a little suspicious, and he said, it's okay, that's nothing, they're nothing, it's fine. So we go and we go back into the backlands and pick up our load and put it in the trunk and we're driving back across and I, um, we get probably a mile or so back across the border. It was like a movie. Cop cars came out of everywhere. Oh, wow. So we get thrown in the slammer in Calexico. And so mm -hmm. um, his parents get him out. Immediately, right? Immediately. I call my mom, and my mom says to me, you got yourself in, you can get yourself out. So I sit there for a few days, and finally, I guess Robert, from what I understand, he went to my mom and asked her if she would sign the paper so that I could get out, and she did. And um, so I got out, and I went back to her house. I think that was part of the condition. I had to go live at my mom's house. I mean, uh -huh. I lived at my mom's house, but I was never there. Yeah. You know, yeah. I go home and Formality, change. Formality, right. Yeah. Right. So I was never there. So um, that was a federal case, and I had 87 pounds of marijuana in my trunk. They took my car, and they took that, and so I lost um, all of that. And, um, of course, then I was still with him, and we, we still did stuff. <laughs> it didn't stop us from doing the drugs and smuggling them. He was a big time dealer. Sounds like it. Um, he'd been arrested several times and at this point he was like one of the top ten most wanted in California. Oh my. And uh, at times um, I was followed. I had I was followed by the FBI and whoever else mm. and uh, there was a time that I was shot at by somebody I don't know. So I, I slept in my room with a gun under my pillow. So you were living a dangerous life. I was. I was living. But you know what? It was exciting. <laughs> yeah. And it was like, you know. Living on the edge, right? It was. Yeah. It was. Yeah. And it was rebellion, too. You're, yeah. You're, yeah. And so I, you know, I continued to do that. But one day I was, we were going to the movies, but not him. It was me and four, three other people. I'm over 18, I'm 19, 20-ish, and we're driving down the freeway, uh, and I get pulled over with three minors in my car, and because my license plate was tied on, so they pulled me over, <laughs> suspicious. <laughs> and of course, they searched the car, and they found the heroin, my mm. stash of heroin, mm. and I was arrested. This was a state charge now. Oh, boy. And I was charged with sales of heroin, to a minor, three counts of that. Oh, that's really sounds serious. It was very, very serious. And the state back then, uh, they put you out to dry. Right. Basically. They weren't going to fool around. No. Right. Uh -uh. So um, I went into jail. I, I got out. I'm not sure how I got out. And then I had a public defender for the federal case. And I went to him, and he said to me, the day that I was to go in and get my probation for the smuggling, that I needed to plead my case to the court and ask them that I needed help, and that then they would just lock me up. And then when I was locked up, then the state would say, well, the federal people are taking care of her. We'll just give her probation. Mm, okay. And being in a federal prison is better than being in a state prison. Mm. So 
I did that. And I knew when I went to court that day, I brought my little overnight case with me because I knew I wouldn't be leaving the courthouse that day. Mm. Or I would be, but I wouldn't be going home. Right, right, right. And so I was uh, sentenced uh, to a six-year indeterminate sentence, which means I would probably do six years, if not more. Maybe I would do less. So pretty much a minimum of six years right. is what it meant. Okay. Right. Hmm. Wow. And what were you thinking? Uh, were you scared to death? Sort of. Yeah, I was because I really looked young. I, you were young. I looked like I was 14. Oh, wow. And literally, I looked like I was 14. I wore long braids and I wore a little short skirt and, you know, and I'm walking into this prison and That's scary. The, the other women in the prison are watching. So um, they, they have their property, property. And um, mm -hmm. some of them, um, one of them picked me as their property. Mm. Luckily, we were in different buildings and stuff. And so, you know, I know that uh, God had to mm. be in that absolutely uh, with that absolutely so so you went into jail and that's a pretty big deal um and you were scared and there were other inmates that were looking at you mm -hmm. and then in a way that you didn't want them to no. um what happened what happened in jail how long did you serve well i will tell you that i went um it was boring in there you got a TV, you had to go in the other room. I learned to crochet. I crocheted everything. I did anything that they said. If they had a uh, church or choir, I went to that. And uh, if they had speakers, I went to that. And they had a speaker, a group, come in called Addicts for Christ. Mm. And they gave their testimonies, kind of like I'm doing mm -hmm. right now. Mm -hmm. And they gave their testimonies. And I'd never heard that you could accept Jesus into your life mm. and that have a personal relationship with him. Mm. And so I, um, I accepted Jesus, and uh, things started changing. I started reading my Bible, but things didn't change in the prison. They thought I was a, a narc placed in there to tell on people. Oh. And um, I'd been there. I hear my name over the um, intercom to come to the warden's office. I go to the warden's office. She says, uh, your attorney's on the phone. I said, OK. He says to me, uh, happy birthday a day late. And I said, well, my birthday's not till tomorrow. And he says, then happy birthday a day early because I took your case back to court and you're being released. How, how long have you been in jail? At Three time? months. Three months uh, on a six year. Right. And the warden says to me, your papers will be here in about a week to 10 days. So go back and, you know, we'll call you then. The next day, I hear my name called again. To Hold come to on, Mary, Mary Kay. We have to end this part of our interview. And this is a cliffhanger. It's perfect. So stay tuned, audience. We will be back with the second half of Mary Kay's story. You won't want to miss it. <laughs> 